Jeez, how many of these things did he kill? Game bugged out on me, by the way. I had to restart. Templars don't know that it's over. What? Moving on. Ew, nice. Our hunters. Okay, let's get out there and confront Meredith about what happened in here. And here we are, champion. At long last. I imagine you've wanted to be rid of me for some time. I bear you no ill will. You've done this to yourself. You are no mage. But in supporting them, you've elected to share their fate. Knight Commander, I thought we intended to arrest the Champion. You will do as I command, Cullen. No. I defended you when Thrask started whispering you were mad. But this is too far. I will not allow insubordination. We must stay true to our path. Andraste's dimpled butt cheeks. You recognize it, do you not? Your lyrium, taken from the deep roads. The dwarf charged a great deal for his prize. The idol poisoned Bartran's mind in the end. He was weak, whereas I am not. All of you, I want her dead! Enough! This is not what the Order stands for. Knight Commander, step down. I relieve you of your command. 
my own knight captain falls prey to the influence of blood magic. You all have. You're all weak. Allowing the mages to control your minds, to turn you against me. But I don't need any of you. I will protect this city myself. You'll have to go through me. Idiot boy. Just like all the others. She's lost it. Just like Bartrand. Blessed are those who stand before the corrupt and the wicked. And do not falter! Oh, damn. Okay, so that's what ended up happening at the Red Lyrium Idol. Meredith bought it and she fashioned it into a sword. And it drove her insane, just like it did Bartram. And, well, look at her. Shit, she has to die. Probably don't want to be in the way of that. Fortunately, though, the Templars have realized her madness and they've... She's got Cull we got Cullen fighting against her right now. Make your servant begs you for the strength to defeat this evil. Hey, she had her statue. <laughs> Big ass statue. Which I can't target for some reason. There it is. Gate Guardian. Kill it. It's amazing that she could be this insane and not realize it. Claim that everyone else is the ones that have, that have lost their minds. Damn. There we go. There she is again. Another one. This one's not even doing anything. Oh yeah, I got another one climbing down the wall. <laughs> Slave statues. Ow. <laughs> Too much chaos. But she's three quarters dead now. Or about two thirds, rather.
Oh, Hawk's down. Everybody else is here, too. I didn't realize that. Oh, this one's up again. Quit doing that. Not enough that they make innocent suffer. No, we must also have insult added to injury. Spare them, mages. Give them freedom, and they will use it to tear down everything we hold dear. No, no, it cannot be allowed. I will stop it. Do you hear me, champion? I will defeat you. Just all sorts of crazy she's turned into. I mean, I guess you could always argue that she was kind of on the brink of madness before, but maybe you could have could have sort of forgiven her a little bit for, I mean, what she was going through, what she had to deal with, and the kind of threats that she had to face. Why is this taking so long? Can one so... spread quickly. The champion's name became a rallying cry, a reminder that the mighty Templars could be defied. She had defended the mages against a brutal injustice, and many lived to tell the tale. The circles rose up and set the world on fire. More Templars arrived at Kirkwall to restore order, but we were all long gone. We vanished into the hills. And circumstance eventually forced us all to leave the champion's side. Well, all of us except for Anders. You still hear the stories, of course. With each telling they grow, even if at the core remains the truth. A new legend had been born. So that's it. That's the whole story. Then Meredith provoked the circle. She was to blame. Or that damned idol was. Or Anders. Take your pick. Even so, had the champion not been there... 
It might never have even gone that far. I see. So how is hearing all this going to help? You've already lost all the circles. In fact, haven't the Templars rebelled as well? I thought you decided to abandon the Chantry to hunt the mages. Not all of us desire war, Varric. Please, if you know where the champion is, you must tell me. She is a hero. A woman that the mages would listen to. Someone who was there at the beginning. The champion could stop this madness before it's too late. She may be the only one who can. Is that what this is all about? In that case, I wish I could help you. Just tell me one thing, then. Is the champion dead? Though, I doubt that. Then you are free to go, Varric. May the Maker watch over you during the dark times ahead of us. Same to you, Seeker. Same to you. So, did you... Gone. Just like the Warden. That is no coincidence. So, do we proceed with the original plan? Or keep looking? It is in the Maker's hands now. We put our faith in him. There we have it. That was Dragon Age 2. The second of three games, I think it's, uh, I think there might be a fourth in production, but they haven't really released that much information on it. But this game was definitely the most divisive of the three. It was one that sort of abandoned a lot of the sort of like complex RPG roots of the first one in favor of a more action-oriented and simple uh, combat uh, that I guess maybe they figured people would um, appreciate that more similar vein to what they did with the what they went and did with the Mass Effect series where they made the second game less RPG and more actiony. It sort of didn't go down all that well and a lot of fans of the first game sort of rejected this one. And now going through all of that I see a, a, a lot of the criticisms of this game were actually pretty well deserved. The move, the change in combat, it, it doesn't really work as well as they probably thought it would, and it was quite a bit different, so it feels almost like it's just a completely different game series, rather than just a different game in the same series. Also, the whole reusing of the same environments over and over and over and over again, it just... You see the same place again and again, and it gives you the feeling that this was just a really cheap and rushed production. A very big departure from what the first one was, which came across as a rather, I mean, flawed game, but it was definitely had higher production values, and of course the third game in the series was a full-on AAA, uh, probably expensive as hell, took a long time to develop thing. But all that being said, though, I can't really bring myself to hate this game the same way a lot of other people seem to. Because even if you're the scope of the story is quite a bit smaller, it moved away from the whole blight thing and you're not fighting the same antagonist in the same way and the story takes a very different structure than the first game did. Say, it, focusing in a little bit more on the whole city of, a story around the city of Kirkwall, had its ups and downs on one hand, it doesn't feel like it takes place over like a large area, and, but it takes place over a longer period of time, and it gives you better character development for it. We could focus more on Andrews, we could focus more on Fenris, all these other characters, instead of them just simply being people who accompany you and maybe you get a few lines of dialogue out of them when you talk to them in camp or something like that. It really did a lot to flesh out the kind of storytelling of this series, and it did a lot to expand the kind of lore and everything, which had been originally built up in the first game pretty deep to begin with, 
but it expanded it more. Also, it did a lot to establish the setting for what would be the third game, and I can't help but feel like that this game really got put together definitely with the idea that there would be a third game in it. They definitely ended this setting it up for a sequel, as I can't really say that the first game in the series Origins really did that kind of thing. Of course, they did leave some some opening for a sequel with the first game, but it, it was definitely not like, oh, was setting it up for the sequel, because a lot of shit had to happen between Origins and Inquisition in order to set up Inquisition, and, it, and it, the story was told here. I do like the idea that they added a voice actor for Hawk instead of the warden in the first game where you just sort of read text and stuff. It does give a little bit of a disconnect between, like, if you're supposed to be identifying with the person, giving them a more of a personality to themselves and all that kind of stuff is a little strange, but... I mean, they did it in Mass Effect, and then they did it in Fallout, and they did it in a lot of games. I mean, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So there we go. I mean, there was um, probably the weakest of the three games in the series, but it I can't say it's a bad game. It's a pretty good series overall, and even the worst of it is still good. It does do something, and it greatly expands on the concepts that we had seen in the first game, setting it up for the third game in the sense that the whole mystery and the mages thing, and I've probably said this half a dozen times during this LP, that I think the whole mage Templar situation is probably the best example of moral ambiguity I've ever seen in a video game. Because for the most part, it's done in this so poorly it's almost pathetic like stories were written by children when it comes to the whole moral ambiguity aspect when it comes to video game stories because it always seems to boil down to this whole concept of you have a choice to do this or you have a choice to do that and both options seem bad and what do you know both options are bad no matter what you do everything turns out terrible and that's a stupid way to do because you're just going to make the, the player feel like they've been betrayed by doing something. Like trying to make the right decisions or something like that. Now when it comes to the mages, they add they don't really give you a strong choice. I mean, regardless of whether I chose the Templars and the mages, the whole situation will work out the same. Not some different variation of the same hell occurring. But they give you a certain, like, Looking at it from a mile high, you look at it, you see, they're the mages. They are an oppressed people who are basically locked into, locked into servitude, in a sense. They're put in the towers, they're required to stay there, they can't leave. They're afraid of the Templars because the Templars will kill them or beat them or, or erase their minds or something like that if they step out of line. And a, you can look at that and you can be like, oh man, that is a disgusting thing to have in something that's supposed to be a civilization. People are supposed to be civilized, but they treat a section of their population so poorly. But then you look at it from the other side. You look at it from the Templar's perspective. And the mages, just an examination of them, like, it just reveals that they are legitimately dangerous. Demonic possession is always a possibility. Of course, there are going to be mages that, even if they aren't possessed by demons or using blood magic or whatever, they could potentially just end up being evil people like you would expect anybody could be. Only they have a potential of being much more dangerous because they can throw fireballs out of their fingertips. But that's not even the question there. If it were just the average person, like just a small number of their society that decided to... to take advantage of their power for their own gain or something like that. You can't really justify the subjugation of an entire group of people based on something which is really just genetics. But the reality is that the, the possibility of demonic possession means that even entirely innocent people could become the victims of this sort of demonic possession and, and turn evil and become serious threats to other people, to innocent people, so 
it becomes kind of a Typhoid Mary kind of situation. On uh, Typhoid Mary was a woman who lived in, um, I think it was New York City, back around uh, the early 20th century or so, who became um, infected with typhoid. And she didn't actually show any symptoms or anything like that because she was a carrier for the virus, not a, not a person who was symptomatic. So you have an asymptomatic person who carries a disease which could kill people she came into contact with unless she was like enormously careful. And even then, there's a possibility that she could infect people. She wouldn't eventually die from it because it wouldn't kill her because she didn't have the disease. So she just would spend the rest of her life as a potential walking e epidemic. So she was sort of, um, sort of arrested, to, so to speak, and told, like, you, you have this disease, you're killing people, you need to stop doing... So I think she was like a food server or something like that. She was a cook. Where... Yeah, <laughs> it's the possibility of infecting people just sort of like jumps up because she's dealing with all this food and getting people sick through that way well she refused to believe that she was a carrier for a disease she didn't understand the concept she so she went she continued to do that job she continued to infect people and she continued to get people killed they eventually decided to arrest her and keep her confined on some island or something like that. Basically, like, as a sort of minimum security prisoner. Now, like, she... You could say that she didn't do anything wrong. She never intended to hurt anybody, all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't change the fact that she was, in fact, getting people killed. And it happened multiple times. And she seemed to even refuse to accept that possibility or that fact and continued to, like, get jobs as cooks or, and that kind of stuff, getting more people killed. So on one hand, you look at it just like the mages. You can't sit there and blame a mage that got possessed by a demon for being, for being the threat that they are. But the fact remains that they definitely are that threat. But then that sort of turns another, another page in that. You look at it as in... Orsino didn't wasn't a threat, and he probably he was one of the more reasonable people to deal with. Certainly more reasonable than Meredith. But when push came to shove, and you put his back to the wall, and it's like you're all going to die, that kind of situation. He turned the blood magic, and he turned into an abomination, and he became a very real threat and had to be killed. Now, he was a perfectly reasonable person, and he would not have been pushed into that situation if the Templars weren't doing what they were doing, if Meredith wasn't so insanely aggressive. And probably, especially, if you had somebody like Anders not doing what he did. Really set the stage for a really bad situation and pushed them into it. Now, what happens if the mages weren't pushed into having to defend themselves? How many of them would succumb to blood magic or demonic possession if they weren't being pushed into it by the Templars or society as a whole, essentially fearing them? You look at the Tevinter Imperium. What's left of it is largely run by mages. Mage, uh, mages are at the highest levels of government, all that kind of stuff. It does not appear to be a kingdom that is just... just filled with demons running around slaughtering people in the streets. They survive it. But you also gotta look at it that it was a bunch of mages in the Tervinter Imperium thousands of years ago that started the whole blights and raised the archdemons and all that kind of stuff. So there's just so much there. So much evidence of both sides of the argument that I can't really even say that I feel comfortable falling on one side or the other. And it's not just because every decision you make is wrong. It's just that, like, everybody's guilty of something. And I tried to... I would have tried to push Hawk to being sort of, like, neutral on the issue completely, but I knew eventually you had to take one side or the other, and I chose mages in this playthrough. So there we go. We've reached the end. The credits are going to roll. I'm going to quit talking now. I will be playing the game Dragon Age Inquisition after this.
I'm not quite sure where this is going to get uploaded, but um, I'm like 40 episodes in advance of what I've actually uploaded by the time I recorded this. Okay, so that's the end of Dragon Age 2. If you like what you see here, I have a crap ton of other games that I have played on this YouTube channel. Go check those out. And thank you for watching, and goodbye for now. Okay, is everyone gone? Good. You know what I don't like? That people look at me weird when I buy a Nerf gun. I mean, Nerf guns are awesome. So what if it's weird and an adult goes and plays with a toy intended for children? I mean, seriously, what's wrong with that? Nerf guns are awesome. I encourage everybody to get a Nerf gun because you can shoot people with them and it doesn't hurt them. I mean, it'll probably piss someone off if they didn't know you are about to do it, or something like that, so just don't run up to people on the street and shoot them with a Nerf gun, that's just weird. Plus you might, I mean, probably get arrested for that shit. But anyway, Nerf guns are awesome. Just realized that I haven't torn a page off my calendar in 20 days. Why do I even bother with this shit? This is January 20th on it. It's what, um, February 6th, not quite 20 days, but getting there, you know? What is the point of spray on deodorant? I don't understand that either, because, I mean, as convenient as it seems, the fact is that that crap does not last as well as, like, a solid stick of deodorant. I mean, even, like, the the clear roll-on gel deodorant lasts longer than than spray-on deodorant. It's just plus like aren't aerosols bad for the environment or something like that. It just seems really like it doesn't work. Stop buying spray-on deodorant. Everybody stinks because of it. Plus I mean it tends to stink as it is. I mean holy shit what's with people and like their weird deodorants and they think it needs to have some special scent to it. It's there to keep you from stanking. Not to make you sound like a, or smell like a frickin' spice aisle. I got a lot of books around me. I can't say I've even read a quarter of them. A lot of books in this room. I've had a Netflix subscription for a number of years now. I just realized that I haven't really gone and sent any of my Netflix DVDs that I'm still getting in the mail back in a long time. I mean, I got one sitting next to me. What's in this? I don't even know what's in this fucking thing. Does anybody remember the movie Norbit? Who's in that? Did I, did I put this one on the Netflix queue? I don't remember putting it there. What is, what is the description here? Eddie Murphy. Is this like an old Eddie Murphy movie? Because the old Eddie Murphy movies were awesome. Anything after like 2000 sucked ass. Is this an old Eddie Murphy movie? 